Yeah, they'll all see how this one goes, and then they'll decide. <laughs> I assume it's an honor for me to get to introduce Tesla, and I, I actually find it really interesting that her fun fact was what I thought most people already knew about Tesla. <laughs> so um, many of you probably listen to the graduates on, on KALX, the Berkeley radio station, and Tesla is the producer and the, um, what do you call it? The host, that's right, the host and producer of this. She revived this show um, soon after she arrived on campus, and what it is is interviewing graduate students from across the different departments and colleges on campus about their research. Um, and it's fantastic. So if you've missed it, you need to go check it out. It's also a great opportunity um, for those of you who are graduate students to have a chance to, to talk about your research and get that experience of, of talking to the press and the media. <laughs> um, yeah, so Tesla did her undergraduate work at Princeton and then came out to the Bay Area. And I luckily uh, got to meet her soon after that. She's been um, working in my lab, actually, since, like, what, 2007, 2008? 2007. <laughs> um, went on to do a master's um, degree at San Francisco State University and then came here to join our, our Ph.D. program in uh, 2012. So she's now in her fourth year. So what she's talking about today, and I thought I'd kind of add on to Michael's statement about that this is not her finishing talk, but Tesla has pulled together a bunch of really interesting pieces of data that tie together into one really interesting story. And so this is not the, the, the dissertation. This is the, hey, check out what I found and help me figure out how to poke holes in it. So um, I deeply admire your, your, your quotes for to do this. It's wonderful, and thank you. And I think it's a cool story. I hope you all do, too. OK, yeah, thanks. So I will definitely start by saying, Thank you to everyone for coming, and thanks for letting me speak at MBZ Lunch. It's definitely an honor. And yes, yeah, so this is this is my dissertation work, but it's work in progress. So I definitely appreciate any feedback uh, at the end of the talk or later if you want to email me. All very appreciated as I start the, the initial writing stages. So with that said, environmental change, resource availability, and the evolution of dental eruption patterns in Ardeodactyla. And yes, this is a baby pygmy hippo, in case you're wondering. It's not an animatronic machine. This is a, a real live animal. <laughs> Very cute. Uh, so first, I'll just give a brief overview of the talk. I'm going to give some background. Very necessary. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the different parts of this dissertation. One is a survey of extant taxa. Uh, I also ran an ancestral state reconstruction, looking at these traits. Uh, I gather some information about the fossil record to incorporate that into what I found and see how it compares. And I also looked at some life history variables to see how they associate with some of the things that I found and then the necessary conclusions as well. So just as some background, I want to start by saying that environmental change and resource availability, availability have been very influential and uh, in the evolution of mammalian craniodental variation. So this is one of the more classic examples. This is the evolution of hypsodont dentition in mammals. And hypsodont just means with a really tall crown. So you can see this figure is from Stromberg 2006. And here you can see that the abundance of hypsodont mammals, and in this case ungulates, increases dramatically during the Miocene. And this is thought to be related to the spread of grasslands, increased aridity, and also uh, increased airborne grit. So this is just one example of how environmental change can influence mammalian craniodental variation. So why teeth? This might be background for a lot of you or some of you, but I figured I'd give it anyway. Uh, the teeth are really important. They act as an interface between an animal and its environment. And for most mammals, they're, they're pretty much the primary way of gathering and processing food before it's digested. Um, so again, also very associated with diet and the different types of diet. Uh, they're strongly heritable. The morphology of teeth is very heritable, strongly controlled by genetic effects. And uh, teeth also are really well preserved in the fossil record. They're about 98% inorganic, so a lot of paleontological material is comprised of teeth, and they can tell us a lot about animals in the present and the past, so that's great. And also, vertebrates only evolve teeth once, so there's a lot of homology and shared ancestry in vertebrate dentition. So that makes them a really interesting system. 
uh, mammal teeth in particular. This is sort of a horrifying uh, <laughs> <laughs> specimen, but I think it shows well. Uh, mammals are characterized by have, being diphyodont, meaning they have two generations of teeth. They have their deciduous teeth, which are the baby teeth, and then they have the adult teeth, or the permanent teeth, that come in later in life. And this is a human, a juvenile human, with parts of the skull removed so that you can see both generations of teeth. So that's a full complement of teeth in one juvenile individual. Although clearly the permanent teeth have not yet erupted. So uh, this second gener having these two generations of teeth is really important because it allows for a lot of size and shape change as the organism grows. Uh, so the teeth can get much bigger and much more complex. And yeah, it, it can allow for extreme complexity. So here we see a warthog. And that M3 there on the right, that's one entire tooth. That's just a multi-cuspate tooth that has a lot of cusps. They can have up to 20 of them. It's a very complex molar and it takes a while to develop as such. So dental eruption patterns are also really important. The timing and the pattern of eruption are they're strongly influenced by genetic effects and they vary across taxa. Uh, they're also functional, so we see a lot of examples of diet and ontogeny of diet being related to eruption patterns. So for example, weaning, when the animal actually weans and starts processing its own food. Um, also behavior and group dynamics, so another great example is in primates with the canines, which are like the blade-like teeth that a lot of mammals have in the front. And uh, actually the juvenile primates, they keep those teeth developed, but inside the maxilla they don't actually erupt because as soon as those teeth come in, they're going to have to fight their, against the other males, and that's like male-male competition. So the longer they stay in the mouth, the longer the animal can safely be a part of the group and not have to compete for its place in the social structure. So uh, here's just some background on the morphology of teeth. Make sure we're all on the same page here. Uh, so uh, mammals are characterized generally by four uh, classes of teeth. So we have the molars, which are in the back of the mouth. Those are like the grinding, processing teeth. And then there's some premolars right anterior to that. Uh, the canines, as I said, are the, the large blade-like teeth. Um, they're reduced in humans, obviously. And then we have the incisors, which are the most anterior teeth in the mouth. So for this project, I'm focused on the post-canine dentition only, so that's the teeth posterior to the canines. And that's because a lot of work, including work that's come out of our lab, has shown that the, that the classes of teeth are modules that are genetically and phenotypically somewhat independent from each other, and the anterior dentition are actually completely independent from the posterior dentition, at least in work that's been done in baboons and mice. So um, I'm focusing just on the post-canine dentition for this study. Um, and actually, I'm focused mostly on the third molar and the fourth premolar, specifically, and the pattern of eruption, and which one of those comes in last. And I just wanted to say something about the significance of the third molar. It's one of the more variable teeth uh, that we see in mammals. In humans, it's actually a really significant tooth. That's the wisdom tooth, right? So probably a lot of you have had your wisdom tooth removed. And so it's this complicated question of why is it so variable and what's happening in all these different taxa. And also, uh, literally billions of dollars are spent removing these teeth in humans, at least in the Western world. So it's, it's, a, it's an issue of concern for many different fields. Okay, so my hypotheses. One, I hypothesize that dental eruption patterns cluster phylogenetically. Okay, there's, that there will be a strong phylogenetic signal in the distribution of this trait. I also hypothesize that eruption of the third molar last is the ancestral state <coughs> in artiodactyls. Humans also erupt our M3s last, and so um, this is my hypothesis for this group. But I also have some questions, <coughs> including what factors are driving the evolution of dental eruption patterns? Is it life history? Is it resource availability? Biomechanics of chewing, etc. cetera. Uh, so why did I pick the artiodactyls? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of reasons. They're a really great group. It's a large clade with more than 200 terrestrial taxa. So this group also includes the whales, but I did not consider them in this uh, project for many reasons, but yeah. Uh, so the group is almost exclusively herb herbivorous. Actually, a lot of them are obligately herbivorous, and um, that's not including the suets, those are om omnivores. But a lot of them 
are obligately herbivorous, which means they play a large role in their ecosystems. And a lot of them are also habitat specialists, which means that they're, they can be strongly impacted by environmental change. They're sensitive to it. There's also a, a low disparity in general body morphology, meaning that they all have four legs, you know, uh, they have a head, and uh, there's, <laughs> there's, version, there's variation in size, but generally they don't look that different from each other. Um, they also have an, a rather ancestral dental formula, meaning that they have teeth from all four classes. So this is different than mice, for example, which only have the incisors and the molars. They have teeth from all four classes. They're also almost globally distributed, so they've been a really successful group, and you can find them just about everywhere. Um, they're really abundant. Uh, they have a really well-sampled fossil record, which is also good for some of the questions I want to ask. And uh, maybe most importantly, maybe not, but uh, they are agriculturally, economically, and environmentally and culturally very important. So basically the majority of meat, skins, uh, milk that is produced on this planet is coming from artiodactyls. So they've been very influential in human history as well. And what do they look like? You've got to have a picture showing what they look like. Here's just a few examples from the tiny poodoo of the up Upper right, that's the smallest deer in the world, it's South American. Um, we've got the giraffe, a moose, we've got a garanook in the bottom right, and then the warthog in the middle, uh, and then of course the mountain goat in the, in the top middle. So, just a cute animal slide. <laughs> so, let's, uh, we can talk a little bit about their evolutionary history. Horses and rhinos, which are not artiodactyls, those are perissodactyls, uh, but are somewhat closely related to artiodactyls, they split uh, probably more than 75 million years ago. All these dates are from a molecular phylogeny produced by Meredith et al. in 2011. Um, camels split after that about 65 million years ago, and then the suids were soon after, 62, around there. Um, <coughs> hippos and whales, so they're, they're grouped together, um, but just talking about the hippos here, they diverged about 55 to 60 million years ago. And then the ruminants, which is a group uh, that's defined by their specialized uh, what's that called? Digestive system. Uh, they split about 40 million years ago. And then stem bovids, which would include cows and goats and uh, other things to that effect, they split about 18 million years ago. So this is just some general background on that. Okay, so what did I do? Um, this is for the survey of extant taxa. I looked at specimens here in the MVZ and also at the National Museum in Washington, D.C. And I surveyed 80 genera and 99 species of artiodactyls. Um, and in order to figure out this dental eruption pattern, I had to look at specimens across ontogenetic stages. So I had to um, find specimens that were juveniles and adults to look across the range. And as I mentioned, I was only looking at the post-canine dentition. So which erupts last, the M3 or the P4? So just to give you an example of what that might look like if you're looking at a specimen, here is a sensorus with all of the teeth labeled. So in this specimen, you can see that the M3, the adult M3, is erupted. It's in occlusion, so it's grinding against the other tooth. But still, the deciduous premolar is in place. It hasn't, the adult premolar hasn't even started to erupt. So in this case, the uh, P4 definitely erupts last. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, this is a goat. And you can see in this specimen, the adult P4 is almost fully erupted, but the adult M3 is still locked in the crypt. It hasn't come out of the maxilla. It has not begun to erupt at all. So in this case, the M3 erupts last. Here's another example where the M3 erupts last. This is another goat. You can see, again, the P4 is fully erupted in occlusion, and the M3 is not quite there. It's still erupting. Here's a pig. This is a warthog. So again, here the P4 is in occlusion. It's actually fairly worn. You can see some of the wear patterns in there. It's been in use for a while. And the M3, again, is still locked in the crypt. It has not begun to erupt. Um, there were also some cases that I called simultaneous eruption. And these are cases where, uh, so this should say uh, P4 there. But so you have the adult P4 and the adult M3. And they're both erupting at about the same time. And basically, I didn't have enough specimens to confidently say which one is going to erupt last. So I called it simultaneous for the purpose of this study. So here's what I found with the survey of extant taxa. 
Um, I was able to definitively assess the post canine dental eruption pattern in 63 of the genera. 45 of them had the P4 erupting last, 15 had the M3 erupting last, and then I found three with simultaneous eruption of the P4 and the M3. And then there were four that are likely erupting the P4 last, but I didn't have enough specimens to confidently say that. So for future analyses, I've left them out, but um, I need more samples to say that for sure. And then of the specimens I looked at, at 13 genera, I could not determine the dental eruption pattern because there weren't, wasn't a large enough sample for me to look across onto genetic stages. And then 11 genera were just not available at either the MBZ or the National Museum. And those included seven bovids, two cervids, a hippo, and a pig. So, I also wanted to say that I did an investigation of intraspecific variation to see how much these eruption patterns might vary. So I looked at the sheep here in the MVZ. This is a picture of one of the sheep. Uh, I didn't know this, but actually several of the specimens were accessioned to the museum uh, through California law enforcement. So they have these evidence tags on them in the officer's signature saying where they were picked up and, and then they were accessioned. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, but I looked at all of the sheep, 186 of them. They're all downstairs in the skins room. Of those, 49 of them are dentally juvenile, meaning they haven't fully erupted all of their teeth. And of those, 15 of them are erupting either the P4 or the M3, so I can use them to assess this dental eruption pattern. Of those, four of them clearly show that the P4 is in occlusion, fully erupted, while the M3 is still erupting and zero show the M3 in occlusion while the P4 is still erupting. So there's no variation in a post canine eruption pattern for these teeth in this group. Uh, I would also like to note this highlights the large sample size that you need to really establish the post canine eruption pattern because only four of them were useful out of 186. So you need really large sample sizes. Okay, what did I find? So I'm uh, going to use the simple phylogeny first, and then we'll go into a more complex one. But just to summarize briefly, I found the camels, the suids, and the peccaries, and the hippos all erupt the M3 last. And then the deer and bovids erupt the P4 last, although there are some exceptions within the bovids we'll talk about. OK, so what does my ancestral state reconstruction look like? It's pretty dense, so we're going to walk through it for a few slides. But generally, this is it. I ran into the ski. Um, black means that the P4 is erupting last. Uh, gold is the M3 erupting last. And then blue is simultaneous. So I went for those cow colors, you know, right? Okay. <laughs> so you can see the suids here on the left. They all erupt the M3 last. And the ancestral state reconstruction supports that the ancestor of all artiodactyls erupted the M3 last with a 93.5% likelihood. So it's pretty high. Um, also, the camels erupt the M3 last, they're the next to diverge, and the ancestral state reconstruction supports that that node erupted the M3 last with a 92.2% likelihood, so also pretty high. We can uh, look at the hippos as well. Uh, you can see that the node there, 83.8% likelihood that the hippos and all ruminants erupted the M3 last, but then it moves to 100% likelihood that the P4 erupted last in the basal node of the ruminants. And that uh, switch happened between 40 to 55 million years ago, knowing what we know about molecular and fossil data, with the molecular and fossil data we have about these divergent stones. So the switch definitely happened, or appears to have happened 40 to 55 million years ago. Within the ruminants, there are some exceptions. These are all within the bovids, as I mentioned. You can see the oryx has this simultaneous eruption. Uh, this is a relatively recent genus that uh, evolved sometime in the Pliocene. They're an African Arabian antelope uh, that is a roughage grazer. Also, Arabia, uh, it's a small antelope of sub Saharan Africa, it appears to have simultaneous eruption. But the big hotspot here is definitely within subfamily Cacrinae. So, this is the goats and sheep uh, subfamily. And uh, so, we will zoom in on this a little bit more. So this is family Bovidae here, um, switch now. But you can see subfamily Caprine there, uh, Ovis, that's the sheep, Capra, the goats, and Hemitragus all erupt the M3 last, uh, uniquely among the Bovids and the ruminants. And then there, we see simultaneous eruption in uh, Pseudoes and Oriamnos. And I would like to say that there's still a lot of debate about the phylogenetic relationships among uh, this group. 
and some of the more problematic taxa would be Budorcus and Oriamnos. And so um, it's possible that <coughs> these data can help contribute to our understanding of the relationships between some of these extant taxa. So, part one. Uh, hypothesis one, dental eruption patterns cluster phylogenetically. This is supported by my data. The subfamily Caprine is unique among the ruminants. Uh, and so that's pretty interesting. I think so. And hypothesis two, eruption of the third molar last is ancestral in artiodactyls. This is also supported. And then we see a shift <coughs> to the eruption of the P4 last in ruminants 40 to 55 million years ago. So I want to see what the fossil record has, has to contribute to our understanding of this. Um, so here are just a few <coughs> examples. Diplobune there, it's a European artiodactyl from the Eocene about 35 million years ago, and it erupts the P4 last. <coughs> so that fits really nicely into my ancestral state reconstruction, placing that uh, character change at about 40 to 55 million years ago. Uh, we can also see <coughs> Neanticorus, which is this uh, pig here, an African suid from the Miocene about 10 million years ago. It erupts the M3 last, so that suggests that the suids have been erupting the M3 last at least until the Miocene, but probably all the way back until the ancestral node. And then Myotragus is a European caprine, so from the subfamily Caprine, and it's from the, about 3 million years ago prior to Pleistocene, and it erupts the M3 last like we see in the extant goats. So next I wanted to ask, what, uh, what factors are driving evolution of these dental eruption patterns? So first I wanted to ask this about the switch from the M3 erupting last in basal artiodactyls to the ruminant dental eruption pattern of the P4 erupting last. And I think it might be related to diet and the biomechanics of chewing. The ruminants are uh, unique in having this unfused mandible and this really anterior placement of the masseter muscle, which is used in chewing. So I think that these uh, features might be associated with this dental eruption pattern. You can also see that the wear patterns, there's a characteristic ruminant wear pattern, um, as you see here in this reservice, where there's a concavity at the P4-M1 junction. And uh, it can be really dramatic, as you see there on the right, this really dramatic concavity. And so I think that it's possible that the P4 is erupting later to sort of buffer this stress. Uh, this concavity is likely where the maximum force is being exerted during the chewing processes, and so it's wearing down there much, much more severely. And so erupting the P4 last could serve as a buffer to that because it comes in later and it can extend the life of the chewing surface by buffering against that strain. So that's one hypothesis about that. Uh, also, you want to ask what's driving these dental eruption patterns in caprines? Okay, so for me, this is. Um, one of the more interesting questions here. Uh, the caprines evolved in the Miocene uh, about 15 million years ago in Asia. Um, and one thing that really sets them apart from a lot of the other artiodactyls is that they're specialized for high elevation life as a group. So how would this contribute to dental eruption patterns? Well, we know that diet and dental eruption are intimately related. Uh, these high elevation mountain systems, there are more limited resources and so limited resources can affect dental eruption in, in multiple ways. One is that when you have limited resources, it takes longer to develop. You have a slower life history because it takes longer to actually develop all the, more, you know, the phenotypes. So this can re result in delayed M3 eruption by just taking longer to get all the resources. On the other hand, if you have limited resources, it pays to have more complex dentition because then you're more generalized and you can process a wider range of food types. So if you need your teeth to be more complex, this can also result in a, a later M3 eruption and that it takes longer for that complexity to develop. So going back to Myotragus, right, this goat we were talking about earlier. Um, so this is where it's found. It doesn't look too shabby. It's me, the Balearic Islands of Spain. Um, again, it's a goat that's found from the Pliocene to the Holocene, so about 5 million to 10,000 years ago. And in this group, the M3 erupts last, but um, the authors or like some of the main researchers studying this group, Jordana and Kohler, have noted that the M3 actually comes in even later than you see in extant caprines. And they hypothesize that this might be related to limited resources on this island system. That as an insular bobbid, it's not getting all the same, doesn't have the same access to resources, and so the M3 is even more delayed than you see in extant groups. So now I'm going to add this third hypothesis to my work, which is that 
within ruminants, eruption of the M3 last is associated with habitation of high elevation mountain systems. So I wanted to try and think of a way to test this, and one way <laughs> is through life history variables. So uh, along with an undergrad or undergraduate researcher in our lab, Madeline Zercher, um, who actually has some connections to the MDZ, uh, we, so we gathered life history variables on these taxa from the literature. We looked at average lifespan, height, length, and weight. Weight was just for the males. Um, we looked at litter size and preferred habitat, and we always use wild data uh, when possible, when, like in almost every case, but there were a few cases where we subbed in captive data for wild data where it wasn't available. So what do these look like? This is just within the <coughs> ruminants, trying to understand why the subfamily Caprinae might be distinct. So when you look at average lifespan, there's no significant difference between animals that ruminants that erupt the M3 last and the P4 last. Um, and these are using uh, independent two-group man Whitney U test. I wanted to use non-parametric statistics because of the low sample size in the um, the taxa that erupt the M3 last. Uh, here's average weight for the ruminants. Again, no significant difference between groups. Um, average height, no significant difference. Uh, average length, again, no significant difference uh, between the two groups. But when you look at habitation of mountainous ecosystems, uh, there are three genera in the ruminants that erupt the M3 last, and 100% of them, all of them live in these high elevation mountain systems. In contrast, there are 45 genera that erupt the P4 last, and only 12 of them, about 27%, inhabit high elevation mountain systems. And this difference is significant. Um, and with a p-value of 0.00935. So going back to my hypotheses, uh, yes, uh, dental eruption <coughs> patterns cluster phylogenetically. This is supported by my data. And again, the, Capri the caprines are unique. Um, also, eruption of the third molar last is ancestral in artiodactyls. This is also supported. Um, and we see that shift 40 to 55 million years ago in the ruminants. And now I would add that within ruminants, eruption of the M3 last is associated with habitation of high elevation mountain systems. Um, and this habitation of mountain ecosystems is the only life history variable that I found to be significantly associated with last eruption of the M3 in ruminants. So, some conclusions. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like no joke living up there, right? Look at the things these goats can do. I mean, that's not how I want to be eating my lunch, that's for sure. But it's pretty amazing. Uh, so, conclusions. Uh, I guess I'm a little early, but it's okay. Question. Eruption of the P4 last is a derived character in ruminants. And evolution of this eruption pattern probably occurred about 40 to 55 million years ago. The goat subfamily secondarily evolved late eruption of the M3, probably sometime in the Miocene. And, uh, well, first I wanted to say that the Miocene is, as we mentioned earlier, is, is generally considered to be a warm period that's characterized by these expanding grasslands and increased aridity. And it's also a time when there's a lot of tectonic activity. So that's when we see, uh, so like the Cascades and the Sierras and the Andes are starting to form, and this is after following the relatively recent formation of the Himalayas and the Pyrenees. So there's all these new mountain ecosystems that are appearing and these changing grasslands, and so environmental conditions were definitely changing during this time. Um, we found, or I found that the Caprine <coughs> eruption pattern is significantly associated with the habitation of these mountain ecosystems, and I think that it may be associated with the resource availability that's uh, in these high elevation mountain systems. And I just want to say that I, I think this work has a lot of different implications. Uh, one example would be for our understanding of how current and future environmental change might impact these groups of organisms. I also think, I also think it has implications for our understanding of high elevation bio biology in mammals. And um, I think that these data can help contribute to some of these discussions about the phylogenetic relationships among extant and extinct artiodactyls. And so with that, I want to acknowledge uh, these people and museums, uh, my committee, so <laughs> several of which are here today, uh, my lab, of course, and uh, funding from, the, from IB and from the MBZ. And I am happy to take <laughs> any questions.
clear on where those are in phylogeny? Are they three separate colonizations in high elevation, or is it one colonization followed by diversification? So this is something I'm looking more into, but based on what I've read, there um, this is, the hypothesis is that the ancestor of all cap rides inhabited, it, it spread into a high elevation niche and that they adapted there. They have a, a variety of uh, adaptations, morphological and um, molecular, and so including like really short um, metacarpals and some other aspects. So, and they're all shared across the group. So it's thought that the ancestor actually developed those specializations and then they were able to spread across many different mountain ranges. Question? Uh, how, what, what are your sample sizes like for those particular taxa? I'm a little bit concerned about the intraspecific variation issue because we know with primates, it's very common that you have multiple eruption sequences. So I'm a little bit worried that you... Yeah, so, uh, and, that, and that is why I did that intraspecific uh, investigation, but yeah, it's hard to get large sample sizes. For the goats, I have you know, I mean, I pulled at least 10 specimen numbers that definitely show the same eruption pattern. Um, and for the sheep, I have about four to six. And then hemitragus, I think, is almost closer to five. But some of the ruminants where I found the P4 erupting last, I was only, only able to get like two to three specimens showing it. But I, I used definitely a minimum of two to three for every genus that I sampled. And you didn't see any variation in any of those that you had multiple? I did not, but I think that if you looked at like 500, maybe it would come out a little different. Um, and so I was thinking about looking at the uh, mule deer here in the NBC because there's a large collection and, and adding to that obus uh, interspecific variation. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is for those taxa where M3 and P4 do not erupt last, is it sometimes because they have more than three molars? Does it have to be the most posterior? No, it's just that they're simultaneous and that I can't really say which one's erupting last, but okay. it's either the P4 or the M3 or they're coming at the same time. It's not another two that's coming in last. From so it's always P4. either I don't want to say always because I didn't focus general. on like the P2s, okay. um, but does that, does that answer your question halfway? Yeah, mm -hmm. and then for the different life history um, variables that you looked at. Did you look at <coughs> Asia weaning? I have not looked at that one yet. That's one I was thinking about putting in, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question. So if you see a single evolution of a high elevation life history or life habit, um, and that's correlated with this eruption pattern that you see, <coughs> is that uh, still significant? If Because it's really just an, an N of one, right? That for the event? In, in terms of like a phylogenetic correction for the traits that you see, you're looking for a correlation between high elevation life habit and the eruption pattern that you see. But if both of those have a single common origin across the caprins, then <coughs> is that test still significant? So that is a great question, and I am looking into running these with like more phylogenetically constrained statistics, but I guess um, I would say it definitely had to have been useful in order to be maintained in all those different groups. And so my next my next steps were definitely going to be to explore the fossil record more and really become intimately familiar with the evolutionary history of the group to see if I can definitely track it all the way through. And But yeah, so I'm going to try and run some phylogenetically constrained statistical tests. I was, yeah, I was also one, one way of trying to get at that maybe a little more finely would be to try to find uh, Caprin species that have variation in the elevation that they live at, or ones that we've domesticated. And I know it's hard to get the sample sizes, but if you could to see, to treat the eruption pattern as a more quantitative character and look for finer scale variation in that correlated with the elevation that they live at, could be a way of trying to get around the, the phylogenetic constraints that you only have a single evolution of yeah, high elevation I, like this. I guess the question then would be like, how long do they have to have lived? exclusively at that elevation for it to become. Totally, yeah. Question? Yeah, so I might have missed this, but um, do you have a specific functional hypothesis about why the M3 <coughs> coming in last would be advantageous in these sorts of high elevation environments? So yeah, I do. My hypothesis is that the limited resources in the high elevation, um, to air, in the high elevation systems are either contributing uh, to a slower life history, which is why agent weaning would be a good variable to investigate, or uh, through just like basically that having this later eruption allows for uh, 
a more generalistic approach to processing vegetation. And yeah, so that's something I definitely need to parse out a little bit more. Marley. Marley. <laughs> 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 they already answered it. Who knows? No. Okay. No. Um, I was curious about a couple of factors here. You seem to be defining an individual as a juvenile as long as P4 was not completely erupted. So given your statement that there were also, you know, sort of the, the long life history, I'm wondering if you have any evidence for dietary modification over either seasonal time or evolutionary time, uh, given the evolution of these long life histories and uh, a long juvenile period in particular. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I do not at this point have any. Um, and so as I focus in more on the cap rinds, I'm going to try and dissect some of these things. I think in terms of the evolutionary history, change in diet might be a little bit difficult because we kind of use the teeth for that, so it's a little bit circular in this case. But, um, but definitely for some of the ontogenetic questions or um, just trying to understand variation among the extants, I think that really getting into understanding each individual taxa is going to be the next step. So many questions. <laughs> um, you mentioned that a lot of these taxa are agriculturally important. Um, can you go to a slaughterhouse and get a lot of data there? Or, or for example, is veterinary dentistry practiced anywhere? <laughs> so in some cases, I, I um, like camels, for example, their dental eruption patterns have been pretty well documented. So that's a case where you could use that to sort of supplement this information. But generally, I think I'm trying to stay away from the, the more domesticated groups. So the goats that I used are um, mostly wild goats, for example, and the sheep as well as the bighorn rocky sheep. So I'm trying to stay away from the domestic ones. Is there a reason for staying away from the goats? Uh, I think it just introduces a few more questions and variables about how um, just basically being domesticated or what sort of diets they're getting might affect the eruption. Um, Jim? Which is brilliant. You know, as a zoologist saying that people are going to mess with your goats in a big way. <laughs> you can go back to millennia of domesticated goats in the Near East and we can get you those assemblages if you just wanted to look at the mandibles and crania, right? But, but in this case, biomechanically, I think you might have something, right? That in addition to thinking about the way that those occlusal surfaces are coming together, but the, the cross-sectional geometries in those crania and how they relate to the, these cat are eating, potentially changing you know, within the lifetime of the goat, but also, you know, through through these selective processes might be another way of doing that. And you do have people exploiting both wild cat rinds, and of course you've got the domesticated stuff in these archaeological records that are big sample sizes. But we want to get you into it. Question? Yeah, I was, you may have mentioned this, but have you looked at the differences in the biomechanics of chewing? Groups. So I've looked at the literature just uh, really briefly, but um, yeah, I, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit different from what I'm used to in terms of literature. So I've been trying to figure out exactly all the different strokes, um, but I know that generally the ruminants are characterized by a similar chewing pattern. So the question would be, are the goats unique among that, or I guess asking, are the ruminants different from some of the uh, other animals and yeah, that's going to require a lot more lit review, I think, to really get to the yeah. bottom of that. There, there's also, um, it's the feed network, uh, and it is a group of biomechanic biologists that have assembled a lot of data on the biomechanics of chewing across a lot of mammalian types. So you might tap into that group yeah. to see whether there's any patterns that might emerge by comparing the, the caprines with the other uh, uh, movements, et cetera. Yeah, thanks. That's a great idea. So, I was kind of thinking that the resource limitation time for a lot of these organisms might be winter rather than summer. Mm -hmm. And they're oftentimes moving out of the high areas. Sometimes you don't have. So, I'm wondering if you might look at migratory information and see if they distinguish at all between the kinds of patterns that you found. Or also, over Comparing overlap between ranges between the number of these, of these species to see if that helps. 
Yeah, that's a great idea, and that sort of ties into the earlier point about you know, variation and elevation, but um, yeah, I think that's a great point. Question? Um, so uh, this is sort of related to Gideon's comment, but um, it's interesting that you compared like, the history traits between the ruminant groups in which the P4 erupts last and the groups in which um, the M30 erupts last. So um, have you thought about zooming out Yeah, that's a great question. And for for several of them, I did actually run it at the artiodactyl level. So lifespan, for example, is not significant even when you include all the other groups. Um, but I didn't run it with mountains, for example. Yeah. So like, I'm wondering if it's um, not necessarily uh, high, like high, at, like altitude, montane environments. But I'm wondering if it's, if it's like differences in quality of the diets that those species. Um, because I imagine, like, I don't know if, like, maybe, like, the silica content, because, um, like, molars are, you know, good for, like, grinding, you know, really tough, like, vegetation. So, like, I'm wondering if the group in the groups where the M3 erupts last, if they just eat, they're just not eating vegetation that has a lot of silica or, you know, like, where you necessarily eat molars. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. And, again, yeah, it'll take a lot more of the review. I've started looking at some of the variation in, like, goat diets, but um, yeah, it's a lot of literature to parse through, especially <coughs> since they're so globally distributed, right? And each system is a little bit different. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. you might try, um, there's this European plant trait database. Um, mm -hmm. It's called TRI. Um, the acronym is TRI, and they have like lots of data about different characteristics of like, plants. Like, you know, I think in addition to like nitrogen content, they have data on like silicon content or, you know, things from Try like try, try and do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. <laughs> great. Yeah, thanks for all these uh, databases. Alan Shebel's had his hand oh, up in sorry. the back. Alan. Thanks, yeah. I guess one lesson to the grad students is not to finish early. So I liked your idea of how people are erupting last with the ruminants related to stress. The ruminants are the cud chewers too, so I assume they have more cycles of mastication in the in the life lifetime of the animal? Are they chewing their cud around that level? Could that be related to the origin of uh, late eruption of the before, just cud chewing? I think that, I definitely think that they're focusing their chewing um, towards the, the P4 and that it could be related. Um, but again, yeah, I'll have to look into it more. I, I've seen, yeah, they have all these different like mastication cycles that they go through and a lot of them actually like regurgitate their food and chew it more, right? right. Swallow it again. So it's definitely possible. Maybe if, what, one more question, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so, so I assume the cost of erupting the wrong tooth first is that you, you um, wear down the wrong tooth and then have less lifetime with working teeth with these animals, right? That seems like the cost yeah. for Yeah, and it's not just fitness for the individual, but also for their offspring, because if an animal wants to spend more time processing foods because their teeth are worn down, then they spend less time uh, nursing, for example, or they have you know, less plaque nursing resources. So, so I wondered if you, you've been looking at juveniles and adults, but I wondered, and I, maybe this is hard to find, but if you could find really old specimens, like where the animal had been old, and look at um, the wear patterns on the teeth. So um, thinking about, say you showed the, the caprines, I forget if they were sheep or goats, with the really concave wear patterns. If you could look at the really old individuals and look at what part of the, of the dentition is sort of the, the part that fails first and the part that is maybe having that cost to the animal first. And if it was M3 or B4, <laughs> that might help. Yeah. You could see where the cost was and why maybe they were erupting which one. So anecdotally, I could say that it's at that P4, M1 junction for a lot of the groups. But you also see a lot of wear on the M3 in some groups. And so when I was going through and looking at the dental eruption patterns, I did take notes on this. But I haven't had a chance to actually like put it into Excel and see what it says. But uh, that's something I'm hoping to do. Well, I encourage the other graduate students to follow Tesla's uh, lead here. See how much great feedback you get. Uh, and let's give her a thanks.